Hi, my name is Casey Bennett. I'm an education consultant on the Texas Deaf Blind Project, housed at Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And today I'm going to talk to you about evaluation for students who are deaf blind. On the uh, opening slide, you'll find my email address. Um, feel free to email with any questions you may have about this presentation or anything else regarding students who are deaf blind in education. Today, um, I'm going to cover eligibility, both federal and state, and um, review some evaluation tools that might be helpful uh, during the evaluation process, and talk a little bit about interveners and how to determine if your student may need an intervener, um, and also review some tools and show you where to find some resources. So the first thing we'll talk about is the federal definition for deafblind. Uh, deafblindness means concomitant hearing and visual impairments, the combination of which causes such severe communication and other developmental and educational needs that they, the children, cannot be accommodated in special education programs designed solely for children with deafness or children with blindness. That's a lot of words. Um, but uh, the main points that I want to hit here are um, that last part, um, the need for specialized instruction. So um, a teacher of the deaf and a teacher of the blind have lots and lots and lots of things that they can work on with their students who have hearing loss or have visual impairment. However, when you have a student with uh, a combined hearing and vision loss, there are unique needs. Um, and those unique needs cause uh, the need for specialized instruction and allow us to qualify those students as deaf blind. Something we often get asked about is the word severe in this definition, um, and it is not defined. Uh, however, a point that we like to make about the word severe is um, that the intention is not that the students are unable to communicate or that they are merging language users or um, that they have uh, or need have to have uh, cognitive disabilities or learning disabilities. The point of the word severe is that they need that specialized instruction. They need something that's different and unique from other students um, in general education, special education, deaf education, education for students with visual impairments. This is something different. Um, and so that, um, don't let the words severe scare you away. They, can, they could be straight A students um, in general education classes and still need specialized instruction for students who are deaf blind. Now here in Texas, um, we have, have our own definition um, that really just makes it a little easier to understand than the broad federal definition. Um, and for our state definition, we have four ways uh, that students can qualify as a student who's deaf blind. So I'm going to uh, review those four ways and give some examples. The first one um, is really the most straightforward of the four, and that is that they would meet eligibility criteria for a student who's deaf and hard of hearing and for a student who has a visual impairment. So a student comes in, they have hearing loss, the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing does an evaluation, and they would qualify. Same for vision. You know, the, the student comes in, the TVI does an evaluation, the student would qualify. That's a pretty straightforward one, and that student can qualify as deaf blind. They met both eligibility criteria. The second way is a little trickier. Um, they would meet the eligibility criteria for a student with a visual impairment. So, like I just you know, explained, the student comes in, the TVI does their evaluation, and the student will qualify as a student with a visual impairment. What's different in this one is that it also includes students who have a suspected hearing loss. So, we don't definitively know if the student has hearing loss. However, they don't have speech where a speech language pathologist would expect that they have speech or and or um, we've done uh, functional hearing or functional listening evaluations and the student is showing that they're, that they're not functionally using their hearing at, as a student would if they had typical hearing. So we are able to qualify those students um, and provide them services. Uh, typically, the students that we see that qualify under the second way are students with complex medical needs where it may not be uh, safe to put them under anesthesia for um, a hearing test, an ABR. Um, 
Of course, there are other reasons that a student might qualify under this definition. However, um, that is a most common way that we see that. The third way is where it gets trickier. This one is um, a, if a student comes in and they have a hearing loss uh, and they have a visual impairment, however, they wouldn't necessarily qualify if that were their standalone disability. Um, if a student with this mild hearing loss came in, was evaluated by the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, they may not qualify. Um, same with vision. A student has a mild visual impairment and they're evaluated by the teacher of students with visual impairments or the TVI, they might not meet the eligibility criteria. What's really special about the way three is that we can qualify those students. And the reason we want to qualify those students is typically the students with mild hearing or mild visual impairments compensate really well because they compensate using the opposite sense. So if I had a mild hearing loss, I would compensate using my vision to find visual cues to make up for that. Same with a visual impairment. If I had a mild visual, visual impairment, I would use my audition, my listening skills to compensate for that. And when both senses are not uh, working at their full capacity, then there creates a need. Um, there's a need for some specialized instruction, maybe some specific accommodations. Um, and this way three allows us to support those students. The fourth and final way um, is if the student has a documented medical diagnosis of a progressive condition that we would expect to lead uh, to both hearing and vision losses. Typically, this is our students with Usher syndrome that qualify under Way 4, but of course there are many other syndromes um, with this possibility. What makes this one really, really neat is um, with the advancements in uh, medical technology and genetic testing, we're finding these kids at, in infancy. Uh, where we didn't used to find them until they started to have symptoms in middle school, high school, even later than that. So um, when these babies get diagnosis at three, four months old, um, even if they have normal hearing and normal vision, we can get in there and start serving them and start supporting these families and these students and preparing them for the future. Why do we need deafblind eligibility? I covered that a little bit throughout as we talked about the different ways, but um, the deafblind eligibility uh, can help the team identify resources that might be helpful, strategies, um, including topics like counseling and braille instruction, um, tactile sign, tactile language development, orientation and mobility, and other supports that might be helpful to that student or that family. A uh, teacher of students who are deaf blind or a TDB. Um, many of the questions that we get um, around a TDB are listed here, um, such as why isn't a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing and a TVI enough? If we're talking about hearing and vision and we have a hearing specialist and a vision specialist, why is that not enough? Well, um, when we're looking at a student who is deaf blind, we're looking at yes, hearing loss, and yes, visual impairment. However, the combination of those two impairments creates such unique needs. And if we're looking at this student in silos, looking at them as a student who's deaf or hard of hearing and a student who is blind or visually impaired, then we're missing a ton of that overlap. Um, the multiplicative effects of these uh, losses um, create all kinds of unique situations for this student that someone who is trained in working with students who are deafblind is able to support. So what do I do if I get a student who's deafblind and my district doesn't have a TDB? You're certainly not alone. There are not very many TDBs out there at this point in time. Um, so this is a really common situation. Um, and the main thing that is so important to keep in mind is that we are working on teaming. That the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing and the teacher for students with visual impairments are working so closely together, not only in evaluation, but in um, providing services, creating accommodations, 
uh, goal writing, everything to do with the student's programming. Again, we have to find those gaps, um, make sure that we're not working on opposite things, that the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing is trying to make things visual, and the teacher of students with visual impairments is trying to make things uh, auditorily accessible. Um, we wanna make sure that what we're recommending, what we're working on, uh, are working toward the same goal. Are TDBs required members of the IEP committee? Uh, currently, they are not. Um, the uh, state and uh, TEA will be uh, making those decisions in the near future um, on what that will look like in the future in Texas, but currently they are not required members, um, but it is required to have both the teacher of the deaf and hard hearing and the TVI present. What does the future look like for TDBs in Texas? That's an exciting one. Currently, um, we have TDB standards that have been written. Uh, they have been accepted by SBEC, the State Board of Educator Certification, and TEA. Um, a framework has been created, and we are currently writing the exam, certification exam, for TDB certification. So we, it's a long process, so we have a few years left until um, it is rolled out here in Texas, but we are very, very excited for the future um, and for what it means for all of our students who are deafblind here in Texas. Teaming. So as I just mentioned, teaming is so important, um, and that includes during evaluation. Um, there will be different teams for different evaluation tools, and we'll talk about that as we go through the tools. But there needs to be multiple people involved in these complex cases for each child. And don't forget the family as part of the team. They're the most important members of the team um, because they know this student best and they will be able to guide your team. So here's the tools that we're gonna talk about today. There are plenty more tools than this out there, um, but these are the ones we're going to cover um, and we'll go through each one and talk about uh, which team members might be involved and what information you can look to gather from them. So the first one is the, we call it the ADAM LS. It is an acronym, it stands for Assessment of Deafblind Access to Manual Language Systems. Um, it is used for students who are manual communicators, so typically that means kids who sign. Doesn't have to mean that these kids sign fluently. Um, if they're using any type of sign language receptively, um, including gestures even, um, that can be tactile sign, visual sign, hand tracking, even speech reading. This is a really great tool to look at. The teacher of the deaf and hard hearing and the TVI need to do this one together, and of course a TDB if you have one. The purpose of this evaluation is to determine, um, based on the visual impairment, where uh, signs should be produced, so the location of the sign, um, and that could be, uh, needs to be produced at midline or um, to uh, the student's right or whatever it may be. Um, it also help you determine the right, um, the speed in which uh, they can uh, best understand sign when it is produced to them. The distance in which their communication partner should be when signing to them, and many, many, many other things. Um, the whole beginning of this document goes through what each of these things means, um, and, uh, and then the second part of it goes through and helps you uh, evaluate these things and determine which, uh, which of these um, placements will be best for the student. The second tool we'll talk about is the IFI. Again, it's an acronym, Informal Functional Hearing Evaluation. Typically, the teacher of the deaf and hardy hearing takes the lead on this evaluation tool, um, but the uh, first part of this tool is uh, an, inter an interview form and the second portion is a direct observation form. So for the interview piece, um, family input is really, really important. And then um, I typically like to interview two people, at least um, a family member, um, 
often a parent, and then uh, someone else who knows the student really well. That might be the classroom teacher, or it might be the student's intervener if they have one, or a paraprofessional that works very closely with the student. They often have really great um, instincts and observation skills to know what the student is responding to and isn't responding to. This evaluation tool will give you um, data on how they're using their functional hearing in their environments, um, which again, it, we're looking at home, could be community, um, and different environments throughout their school day. Um, how they use their functional hearing will be very different in uh, a gym setting versus in um, a quiet one-on-one -on -one classroom with the speech pathologist. So we want to look at all the different environments the students in throughout the day and determine what their preferred uh, sounds are, their preferred voices, instruments, tones. It gets extremely detailed and it's very helpful. Um, this can be a tool um, used in uh, where we were talking about eligibility a little bit ago in determining if the student is using their functional hearing as they would um, as for a student with typical hearing. This can be a great tool to help your team make those decisions. The next one is the infused skills assessment. Typically the TVI uh, is, takes the lead on this assessment. However, the whole team is really involved in uh, supporting. And this gives you really great data in uh, a beautiful chart, I always like a chart, um, on the global strengths and weaknesses for students who are birth to six and have multiple impairments, including visual impairment. Um, Again, this is looking globally, so it can be really helpful um, in determining what, what uh, goals should be written um, and what can be worked on next. Another tool is the communication matrix. The communication matrix can be given by really anyone on the team, um, and I think uh, is, is best when given as a team. Um, so everybody around a table, um, including the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, the teacher of students with visual impairments, the speech language pathologist, of course the TEB if you have one, um, the classroom teacher, the intervener, uh, maybe the orientation mobility specialist, the students working with one, and even the family. Um, and we can sit around and go through the questions that the communication matrix offers. Um, it is online, which is really nice, and it saves your work. So this is one that you could do regularly, and um, you know, if you come together as a team every three months or six months or a year or whatever you determine is appropriate for this student, um, you don't have to start over each time. It saves where you were, where the student was at the last time that you completed it, and asks you the questions from there forward. So typically it doesn't take very long at all to update this. Um, and it can give you a really great chart that makes it really easy to see um, where the student is currently functioning in their communication, which skills are emerging, and which skills are not yet used so that everybody can, can decide to target um, really, really um, appropriate and next step communication skills. The next one is called Home Talk. This uh, evaluation tool is an older tool. Um, I really love it. It is for families to give input on their child who is deafblind. It comes in both English and Spanish, and it can be given by the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, the TVI, or the TDB. And it looks at um, several areas, including uh, medical, hearing, vision, communication, physical, and cognitive skills. I know when I learned about, first learned about this evaluation tool, I wasn't sure if I should give it to some of the families that I had worked with for many years and knew really closely, um, but I went ahead and gave it and learned so much information about um, their past and how they function at home that I really thought that I knew um, and was missing a lot of, of really great information. So I encourage you to use this tool with your families and learn about what's going on at home and what, how the past has been at home for them. The next one is the tactile working memory scale. This one is for the TDB to give or for the TVI and teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing to work very, very closely on to complete. 
Um, this tool gives you information about how to identify and assess tactile working memory in a student who's congenitally deafblind. Um, this tool is out of the Nordic Welfare Center um, in the Nordic countries and is really phenomenal. Um, when you open this tool, don't be overwhelmed by how long it is. It's very long. Um, it's a manual. It's thick. Um, however, most of it is explaining what tactile working memory is, um, the research on it, um, what all of the terms mean that are located within the scale. And then toward the back, you'll find the scale itself, which is really only a couple of pages. Um, so a little less overwhelming when you break it apart. Um, but I really encourage you to look at it. Um, it's something very different than, than what we look at when we look at a student um, with hearing loss or a student with a visual impairment. This is really specific to students who are congenitally deafblind and um, really important for those students that we're looking at how they're using their tactile skills. So we just looked at a whole bunch of tools and now we're going to talk about where do we put all the results to all of these tools. Um, they can be compiled into appropriate sections of the functional vision evaluation, the learning media assessment, and the communication evaluation. Um, the functional vision and learning media assessment and even the orientation and mobility assessment need to have the functional hearing addressed throughout for our students who are deafblind in order to have that holistic, accurate reflection of their abilities and their access. And the same goes for the communication evaluation. Uh, we need to make sure that the functional vision is included throughout um, so that we have that holistic picture. We also need to make sure that the student's tactile abilities are everywhere. Um, we know that that is the strength for our students who are deafblind. Um, and we will have some new tools coming out um, in 2022. So uh, check with Texas School for the Blind in 2022 to talk about um, where we can put the functional tactile results, um, functional tactile bodily results. Um, so that'll be something we are discussing more and more as we go on. What is an intervener? An intervener, if you're not familiar with the term, is a trained person who works one-on-one -on -one with an individual who's deafblind to facilitate and bridge communication and access. They develop trusting relationships with the student and they do things with them and not for them, which is the intervener motto. They make sure that the student has access to not only communication happening around them like an interpreter would, but also the environment and the things that are happening around them within their setting. So how do I know if my student needs an intervener? Well, we have a tool for that. Um, you may be familiar with the determining the need for an intervener tool out of Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, um, but it had an update. It's in its second edition um, that was published in August of 2021. So if you've not looked recently, um, I will show you in just a few minutes where to locate that on our website. Um, this gives uh, data to support the need for or the lack of a need for an intervener for your student and to justify um, added personnel to administration. We know we need data um, to justify things like added personnel. This should be filled out by a team of people, not by one person. Um, maybe even an IEP committee um, to fill this out. The updated version is similar to the previous version, if you were familiar with that, um, but it has a lot more guiding questions throughout um, to help the team really think about the ins and outs of the unique needs of these students. So other tools. Um, we are going to look at the Texas Deaf Blind Project website, and we're going to look at the um, IEP where I'm going to show you where the IEP quality indicators is located, um, the calendars for students with multiple impairments is located, and the topical resources page, as well as some other resources. I'm going to navigate there to txdeafblindproject.org. Well, across, this is our new website for the Texas Deaf Blind Project. Across the top, you'll see a menu uh, bar. First, I'm going to navigate to products. 
Once I click on products on the right hand side, there's a menu that pops up. And the next place I'm going to look is books, publications, and newsletters. So you'll see these come up in alphabetical order. And the first one here is the Atom LS, which we talked about today. So if you click that link there, it will automatically open uh, the Atom LS for you. It is a free document. The next one is the calendars for students with multiple impairments, including deaf blindness. And when you click that link, it will navigate to a place for you to purchase that publication. That is um, an actual book. The next one is determining the need for an intervener in educational settings. That is the document we were just talking about. That's the second edition of that. Below that is the guidance for planning behavior intervention for children and young adults who are deafblind or have multiple and visual impairments. This is a new publication um, and is really helpful for students who um, have behavior or in distress and uh, can be extremely helpful for the team in determining how to provide support to those students. The next one is the IEP checklist for proficient communicators who are deafblind. And then we have the IEP quality indicators for students with deaf blindness. That is a really helpful tool in making sure that all of the factors that create a quality IEP for a student who is deafblind are in practice, but also documented um, within that IEP. It can be a lengthy tool to complete, um, but I really feel that it is worth the time to fill out. Um, it is extremely helpful to make sure that we're thinking about all the things we need to be thinking about for these students. The next one is the IFI, which is one we talked about today. Again, it's a free download, so you just click this link here. And then we have our Introduction to Sex Ed uh, publication that's here. It's a curriculum, and it is specifically made for students who are deafblind or have significant developmental delays. The next section I want to look at is under Resources. If you click Resources, and then on the right-hand menu, Topical Resources, it opens up a ton of resources. And the sections are in alphabetical order. And the first section is Assessment Tools, which we were talking about today. So here you'll see the Atom LS is listed again, the Infused Skills is listed here, the IFI, Home Talk, Communication Matrix, and more. Um, so definitely spend some time looking through those and clicking those links. If you're working with students who are in the early childhood years, we have a whole section on early childhood. We have a section on uh, educational considerations family engagement, IEP development tools, which includes um, many of the things we talked about today, IEP quality indicators, the determining the need for an intervener document, the new guidance for planning behavior document, and talking about deafblind eligibility, which we covered earlier today. So section on proficient communicators, if you're working with students who are on or near grade level, and um, there's a lot of really great resources there. And then a section on qualified personnel for individuals who are deafblind. And this has a lot of information on interveners um, and also on TDBs, including the TDB standards that I mentioned earlier that have been accepted are um, the bottom link in that section. The next section is tactile learning and tactile language. Um, the first thing there is the tactile working memory scale, which we talked about today. Um, but this whole section is from the Nordic Welfare Center, and I really encourage you to um, go through their site. And um, this, if you see it, you can support it, is a publication. It's a book, um, but it is currently free, and it is amazing. I highly recommend checking that out. And then the last section on this page is transition planning. So if you have students that are in those transition planning years, there are lots of wonderful resources here for you and your team to access. I won't go through everything on the website today, but know that there's sections on behavioral supports. Um, we have a whole new micro site on deafblind interaction. We have information for orientation mobility specialists that are working with students who are deafblind. 
And if you want more information about TDBs or how to become a TDB, there's a whole section on that as well. And we have a new section on instructional strategies that include all kinds of things, including calendars, choice making, and routines. So definitely check that out. On this final slide, you'll find my email address again. Um, and you'll also find an email address that goes to everybody on the project. So if you have a specific question for me, you can email me, or if you'd like to email my whole team, you can do that with one email address at txdeafblindproject at tsdvi.edu. We're happy to talk to you about anything in this presentation or anything regarding students who are deafblind in Texas. Thank you.